This one. That's right, because I'm doing one. Thank you. Mr. Cooper, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. <clears throat> and, may it, <clears throat> and may it please the court. The New York Court of Appeals, <clears throat> Your Honor, observed in 2006 that until quite recently, it was an accepted truth for almost everyone who ever lived in any society in which marriage existed that there could be marriages only between participants of different sex. Indeed, when the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court made Massachusetts the first state to legalize same-sex marriage in 2004, it acknowledged that its ruling, and I'm quoting, changed the definition of marriage as it had been inherited from the common law and understood by many societies for centuries. The traditional definition of marriage has likewise prevailed in California, where, according to the California Supreme Court in the marriage cases, from the beginning of statehood, Marriage has been understood to refer to the relationship of a man and a woman. So the first question, Your Honor, that has to be asked is why has marriage been so universally defined by virtually all societies at all times in human history as an exclusively opposite sex institution? It is because marriage serves a societal purpose that is equally ubiquitous. Indeed, a purpose that makes marriage in the often repeated formulation in the Supreme Court of the United States, fundamental to the very existence and survival of the human race. The court said that in Loving, said it in Zablocki, and several other places, Skinner. And the historical record leaves no doubt, Your Honor, none whatever, that the central purpose of marriage in virtually all societies and all times has been to channel potentially procreative sexual relationships into enduring stable unions to increase the likelihood that any offspring will be raised by the man and woman who brought them into the world. Mr. Olson often quotes, as he did earlier this morning, the Supreme Court statement that marriage creates the most important relation in life. That, court, that quote comes from the Maynard case, Maynard against Hill in 1888. And in the very same sentence, Your Honor, the court went on to say that marriage has more to do with the morals of a people than any other relation. Now the court's specific holding in the Maynard case was that the contract clause of the Constitution does not apply to a state's regulation of the marriage contract because marriage alone among virtually all contractual relationships, in the court's words, partakes more of the character of an institution regulated and controlled by public authority for the benefit of the community. And the Maynard Court explained why the institution of marriage is uniquely imbued with the public interest. Because do, people, it is, do people get married to benefit the community? Your Honor, um, uh, the, they don't, the, the, uh, when, when one enters into a marriage, you don't say, oh boy, I'm going to be able to benefit society by getting married. What you think of is I'm, gonna, I'm going to get a life partner. 
yes, that I can share my life with. Yes, maybe, Your Honor. Maybe have children, uh, but uh, all sorts of things come out of a marriage. But, but, if you, but, but is the purpose of marriage for individuals to benefit society? From the, from the standpoint of the state and the state's interests and society's interests, Your Honor, and this is exactly what the Maynard case was saying and what many, many cases have said uh, in addition, it is that this is an institution imbued with social, uh, with social meaning and social policy and the, and the uh, interests of, of the community. Uh, that's why the state has an interest in it. It may well be that individuals who get married aren't doing it in order to benefit the community, although that is the ultimate uh, result of it. But, but the question has to be, well, why does, why does the government regulate this relationship? Why is it different from well, that's a, a, a good friendship? Question. Why, why does the, the state regulate it? Why doesn't it leave it entirely up to private contract? Your Honor, again, because, because the, the marital relationship is fundamental to the existence and survival of the race. It, it uh, uh, w without the marital relationship, uh, Your Honor, the, the, the society would come to an end. But beyond that, uh, there are important societal values at stake, irresponsible procreation, for example. Well, 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 why couldn't the state simply say, look, marriage is entirely a matter of private contract. We're not going to issue licenses to, for marriage. We're not going to set down a body of law that regulates the rights and responsibility of married parties. We're simply going to say, you enter into a contract, and if you do, we will enforce those contracts if it comes to it, just like the state will enforce any other form of private contracting. But why is it that marriage has such a large public role? Your Honor, I think and this... what is the purpose? I think the of, state could do what you said. But the question becomes, why hasn't virtually any society done what you say? Why is it that every state in this country and every a country, insofar as I'm aware, in the world, does indeed regulate this relationship. It's because this relationship is crucial to the public interest. It's crucial to the public interest because, uh, Your Honor, the uh, procreative sexual relations uh, both is an enormous benefit to society and it represents a very real threat to society's interests. A threat? Yes, Your Honor. A threat in the sense that uh, to whatever extent children are born into the world without this stable, enduring marital union raised and in, in, in responsibly, responsibility taken for the offspring by both of the parents that brought them into the world, then a host of very uh, important and very negative social uh, implications arise and potential social consequences arise. Uh, as, as, again, we know from all of the authorities, the, the purpose of marriage is to provide society's approval to that sexual relationship and to the actual uh, uh, production of children, as Justice Stevens said in his dissenting opinion in the Bowers case. Um, marriage is a license to cohabit and to produce legitimate children. Uh, and well, But the state doesn't withhold the right to marriage to people who are unable to produce children of their own. That's true, Your Honor. It, it, it does not. It does not insist. Are you uh, su suggesting that the state should to fulfill the purpose of marriage that you've described? No, sir. Your Honor, I, it is by no means uh, a, necessary, um, a, a necessary condition or a necessary requirement to fulfilling the state's interests in, in naturally 
potentially procreative sexual relationships. Well, then the state must have some interest wholly apart from procreation in oh, this Your unit. Honor, that, 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 it doesn't necessarily follow that that, that is true. Uh, it rationally furthers the state's interests to extend, uh, to attempt to channel into the marital union all potentially uh, uh, procreative uh, uh, relationships, as well as all uh, male-female relationships. Uh, it, it, it furthers the state's interests, uh, it, Your Honor, and it, and it, and it isn't a, a necessary requirement that the state actually insist that as a condition of marriage that individuals who, who get married have children or be able to have children. Uh, and, Your Honor, case after case has agreed that the simple fact that all societies and all states haven't required a procreation of marital couples in, in no way uh, eliminates the procreative purpose of marriage or doesn't detract from it. Uh, one of the most important reasons is how would a society that wanted to insist on procreation, how would it, how would it go about uh, administering such a, a requirement? Well, the first thing it would have to do, presumably, and again, Your Honor, on this case after case has made this point. The first thing it would have to do is have some kind of premarital fertility testing. Presumably, it'd have to have some kind of premarital uh, pledge in which the couple found to be fertile through the, in some intrusive process also pledged to actually have, have children. There'd presumably have to be some type of post-marital uh, requirement uh, to enforce the actual begetting and raising of children because on what basis could a state, if it wanted to insist on procreation as a condition of the marriage contract, how, on what basis could it, uh, could it uh, uh, require uh, premaritally some type of pledge to have children and some kind of proof of fertility and then not and then allow people who weren't having children to remain married uh, presumably there have to be some kind of mandatory annulment uh, process for marital couples who didn't actually fulfill their obligation to society to actually have a children, you know, those kinds of Orwellian, Orwellian. Well, techniques. it is Orwellian, but isn't that isn't that the the logic of that flows from the premise that marriage is about procreation? If that's if that is the premise for marriage, then the steps that you just outlined would be reasonable and rational steps for the state to take, would they not? Well, the, the question is, would they be required steps? Is, is a state's, in, uh, uh, is, is a state's regulation of the marital relationship, regulation of procreative sexual relationships, uh, irrational unless it insists on procreation? And, Your Honor, by no means is it. It is enough if the state or the society seeks to uh, attempt to ensure and to increase the likelihood, really, that's, that's what it boils down, to increase the likelihood that naturally procreative sexual relationships will take place in an enduring and stable family environment for the sake of raising, uh, raising the children, so that, essentially, the society itself, uh, Your Honor, doesn't have to step in and take upon its own shoulders the obligations to help in the raising of those children, and so society doesn't uh, run the risk of all the negative social consequences that come from, say, unwed 
mothers raising children by themselves and such as that. Well, so if, if the purpose of these marriage laws is uh, regulation of the sexual conduct of the individuals involved, there are certainly far more narrow and tailored ways for the state to regulate those kinds of relationships. But instead, marriage regulation ex extends far beyond regulation of sexual conduct of the parties. There are support obligations and there are uh, a host of other obligations that flow from a marriage that have nothing to do with the sexual conduct of the parties to the marriage. Well, Your Honor, uh, that, that, is, that is true, but uh, a core uh, element of that regulation uh, goes to the, the uh, procreative aspect and, and the uh, expectation in the normal course that children will be born of a marriage and the relationships and rights that there are uh, that are created and within the context of that of that procreative family. And parental responsibilities don't depend upon how the child came into the world. Parental responsibilities extend to adoptive parents who had nothing to do with the uh, creation of the child physically. They extend to uh, in-laws and grandparents and a host of other people who were not involved in any way in the at least directly, in the creation of this child as a human being. Well, Your Honor, uh, with respect to adoptive uh, children, yes, the, the state does make arrangements, and it does uh, create in law a relationship that is, in, every, in all respects, virtually all respects, identical to a natural and biological relationship. It does that again, for the sake of children, for the ch sake of the upbringing of children, and creates, with respect to those children, rights and responsibilities in their adoptive parents that are the natural uh, uh, result of natural procreation. And vis-a-vis -vis uh, the state's interest in the well-being of children, isn't the state indifferent with respect to how the child was conceived, whether the child was conceived in the in a marriage or outside of a marriage or in, in some other fashion. Once the child exists as a human being, the state has some interest in the well-being of that child, wholly apart from whether the child was born in a marriage, out of a marriage, or in some other fashion. Yes, Your Honor, it does, and, and that really is the point. That really is the point. The state has an interest in that child. Uh, it, it cannot ignore uh, the society's larger and the community's interest in that child, and so the and and the state's concern is that if that child is born in in a in a context other than a committed uh, relationship, but but a marital relationship between the man and the woman who created that child and brought it to life, uh, and who have taken responsibility themselves as marriage as a social institution is designed to encourage and to promote that when when a child is not born in that situation yes the state still has an interest in that child the community does uh, and the state must step forward oftentimes and uh, again take responsibility itself for the upbringing and the support in the education of that child, whether it's through uh, uh, extraordinary measures such as uh, uh, when, when, the, when the child has neither its own mother nor its father, uh, and the state has to take full responsibility effectively for the child, or if the child uh, still has, and in the vast bulk of the, of the uh, situations where this actually arises, the child is, is still has a relationship with its natural mother, uh, but the but the mother or the or the single parent, mother or father, uh, doesn't have the same 
uh, ability and support uh, as a marital union to raise that child and, to, and certainly not to provide that child with two parents uh, to, to look after it, let alone two parents that are composed of both a uh, paternal and a maternal uh, parental role model. So it is, you, you've put your finger on, on the key. The state still has an interest in that child. In fact, it has an interest in all children. And that's why the state and every state and every society uh, f for the millennia, Your Honor, has attempted to channel naturally procreative sexual con uh, uh, conduct between men and women into an enduring union, an well, enduring let's, stable let's, union for the, sake of those, for the sake primarily of those children. Let's move from the millennia to the three weeks in January when we had the trial. What does the evidence show? What does the evidence in this case show with respect to this? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I believe the evidence shows overwhelmingly that this procreative, the, this interest in, in what many call, and the United States Congress calls, responsible procreation uh, is, is really at the heart of society's interest in uh, regulating uh, marriage. Okay. It, because, it, it, for example, what, what the evidence shows is that uh, imminent socio... I'm sorry. Well, just... Thank you. Uh, well, just, what was the witness who offered the testimony? What was it and so forth? That's... Yes, Your Honor. Um, the, the, the evidence before you shows that sociologist Kingsley Davis, um, uh, in his words has, de has uh, described the universal societal interest in marriage and, and, and definition as social recognition and approval of a couple engaging in sexual intercourse and bearing and rearing offspring. Blackstone, Blackstone, Your Honor, said that there are two great relations in private life. First, that of husband and wife, which is founded in nature but modified by civil society with nature directing man to continue and multiply his species and civil society, the so social society's interest, prescribing the manner in which that natural impulse must be confined and regulated. And the second great relationship, uh, according to Blackstone, that of parent and child, which is consequential to that of marriage being its principal end and design. It is by virtue of this relation that infants are protected, maintained, and educated. You know, I mentioned earlier another great lawyer, Justice Stevens, who himself, uh, in his dissent in Bowers, uh, said that marriage is a license to cohabit and to produce legitimate children. That's what it has been, what it has always been. These, 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 uh, this understanding of marriage, Your Honor, is before you from eminent authority after eminent authority in well, a look, range of I don't disciplines. Mean to be, I don't mean to be flip, but uh, Blackstone didn't testify. Kingsley Davis didn't testify. What testimony in this case supports the proposition? Your Honor, these, these materials are before you. There are evidence before you, but Mr. Blankenhorn brought forward, uh, uh, brought forward uh, the, uh, these, these authorities uh, and, and that's, and that's the, these social scientists and anthropologists and sociologists and the others. But, Your Honor, you don't have to have evidence for this from, from these authorities. This is in the cases themselves. The cases recognize this one after another. You don't have to have evidence? You don't have to have evidence of, of this point if one court after another has, has recognized let me, let me turn to the California cases on this. The first purpose of matrimony by the laws of nature and society is procreation. The California Supreme Court said that shortly after statehood. A century later, the California Supreme Court reemphasized that the institution of marriage serves the public interest 
because it channels biological drives, channels biological drives that might otherwise become socially destructive. And it ensures the care and education of children in a stable environment. That's the California Supreme Court, Your Honor. That's, that's, that's the purpose of marriage in this state, according to the California Supreme Court in De Berg against De Berg. Two years ago, less than two years ago, the California Court of Appeals held that the sexual, procreative, and child-rearing aspects of marriage go to the very essence of the marriage relation. You know, Congress, in passing uh, DOMA, said the core purpose of marriage is this. At bottom, civil society has an interest in maintaining and protecting the institution of heterosexual marriage because it has a deep and abiding interest in encouraging responsible procreation and child rearing. Simply put, government has an interest in marriage because it has an interest in children. You know, most courts, most of the courts, quite a, a substantial majority of the courts that have looked at the issue that is before you now, have upheld the constitutionality of the traditional definition of marriage because, and these are the Eighth Circuit's words, in upholding a provision uh, enacted by the people of Nebraska that is word for word identical to the one before you. The state it upheld it because, this, this is the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals in 2006, the state's interest in steering procreation into marriage justifies conferring the inducements of marital recognition and benefits on opposite sex couples who can otherwise produce children by accident, but not on same sex couples who cannot. At least two thirds, Your Honor, or just approximately anyway, two thirds of all the judges who have looked at the issue that is before you now have upheld the traditional uh, or would have, some of them are in dissenting opinions, or would have upheld the traditional definition of marriage on this rationale, this rationale. Uh, the majority of Congress enacted DOMA, as I just mentioned, on this rationale. And the plaintiffs, the plaintiffs say, there is no way to understand, understand why anyone would support Proposition 8, why anyone would support the traditional definition of marriage, except through some irrational or dark motivation, some animus, some kind of bigotry, Your Honor. And that, that is not just, <coughs> that is not just a slur on seven million Californians who supported Proposition 8. It's a slur on 70 of 108 judges who have upheld as constitutional and rational the decision of voters and legislatures to preserve the traditional definition of marriage. It, 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 it denies the good faith of Congress, not just these judges of Congress, of state legislature after state legislature and electorate after electorate. Let me ask, if you've got seven million Californians who took this position, <clears throat> 70 judges, as you pointed out, and this long history that you've described, why in this case did you present but one witness on this subject? One witness. Right. Seems you had a lot to choose from if you had that many people behind you. Why not? Why only one witness? And I think it's fair to say that his testimony was uh, equivocal in some respects. Certainly not on this one, Your Honor. And his testimony was utterly unnecessary for this proposition. Utterly unnecessary for this proposition. This goes well, back to the you don't need any evidence you, point. Your Honor, it, it goes to that, again, these are legislative facts. 
You need, pull, you need only go back to your chambers, Your Honor, and pull down any dictionary, pull down any book that discusses marriage, and you will find this procreative purpose at its heart wherever you go. Unless, unless, Your Honor, that book was written by one of their experts or has been written over the course of the last 30 years. Then you will find, yes, that procreation, what has that got to do with marriage? What? And, and the, the pages of history, Your Honor, are filled with nothing, nothing but this understanding of marriage. You will not find anywhere in the pages of history, nowhere, any suggestion that tra tra the traditional definition of marriage, ubiquitous in history, across cultures, across time, had anything whatever to do with homosexuality. It had nothing to do with it. In fact, the issue of people's uh, uh, values with respect to homosexual conduct uh, was, was never in the marriage conversation until the movement for same-sex marriage. Your Honor, at the heart, at the very heart. What should I conclude from that? That, um, Your Honor, at least a important purpose of marriage always has been and still is to channel naturally procreative sexual conduct of men and women excuse me into enduring stable family units through marriage so that the children of that union will be raised by the man and woman who brought them to, to improve the likelihood that that will happen. What has changed in the last 30 years that has so dramatically altered the landscape that you've just described? And I, I'm, I'm, I think my point is the changes in the last 30 years haven't eliminated that legitimate and important purpose of marriage. They well, haven't you, you, pointed, you pointed out that uh, there is this body of opinion, point of view that you've described, that now views marriage as an option for homosexuals. Okay? That is something that has developed in the last 30 years. What is it? And what does the evidence show has prompted that change? Why? Why do we have this? If it has never been a debatable proposition before, why is it now debatable? Well, you're, uh, I, it has become uh, a claim and, and an understandable claim, which, Your Honor, we respect and, uh, and, and credit. Uh, credit certainly the sincerity and, and the passion behind the, uh, the, the desire of same-sex couples to, to uh, get married. And that, and that, that movement has, has, uh, has, has uh, developed, and it has made this, this issue a very important, controversial um, uh, issue of, of public policy. And, and it's, it's one that is, as you know, not just uh, uh, taking place here in California. It's taking place elsewhere in the country. And voters and legislators are, have come to s some different conclusions. It's taking place uh, throughout the world. Um, but, Your Honor, the issue is... Well, if, if it is taking place uh, throughout the country and throughout the world in this fashion, then doesn't that indicate a changed perspective with respect to the role and function of marriage in society? 
In, in, in the minds of many, yes, Your Honor. In the minds of many. And doesn't that affect then the responsibility and the extent of appropriate authority and regulation by the state of the institution of marriage? Your Honor, I think states are uh, examining their responsibilities uh, with, with respect to this issue uh, currently and, and have been over a, a number of years now. And, they, and that and the political process, which is, which given, the, given that this, this issue goes more to the morals of a people than any other relation, uh, as again we know from the Maynard case, that this issue is, is being uh, debated in the political process. But, and, and it has brought forward uh, uh, additional uh, considerations and issues for the legislative process to grapple with. But the real question, Your Honor, is be, it, it, for you is this. Has, has something happened with respect to the nature of marriage the legitimate purposes of marriage to make the historic, uh, consistent, and uh, ubiquitous uh, uh, procreate, core procreative purpose of marriage no longer constitutionally legitimate? Is, is, are, are the considerations, uh, are, the, are the competing considerations which the political process is grappling with on a daily basis here. Are, are those competing uh, considerations so overwhelming that it's no longer legitimate to, for, for the people of California or the legislatures of this country or the Congress or court after court to conclude that there is a legitimate uh, 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 function and purpose of marriage that does bring forward a distinguishing characteristic relevant to interest the state is able to implement. Those words, Your Honor, are, I think, verbatim the words uh, of case after case regarding when it is appropriate for the society, for the state, to draw distinctions, whether or not there is a distinguishing characteristic relevant, and there is a distinguishing characteristic relevant to this core procreative purpose, Your Honor, that justifies and explains the rationality of a preference by legislators or a preference uh, uh, by, by voters to, uh, to and, and a rational basis for uh, uh, maintaining the historic traditional definition of marriage. All right, then let me ask you, you heard Mr. Olson this morning recount the experience of and the background of the loving decision by the Supreme Court in 1964, I think it was, 67. And up to that time, numerous states had laws on the books which prohibited interracial marriage. At some point, there came exactly the same kind of social change that you've just described with respect to homosexuality. And at some point, 1967, that matured into a constitutional, a recognition of a constitutional right, that the limitation against interracial marriage violated a fundamental individual right under our Constitution. Why are we not at that same tipping point here with respect to same-sex marriage? Your Honor, several reasons. Um, among the most important, perhaps the most important, is this. What legitimate purpose of marriage recognized historically or anywhere else 
justified, it provided a rational basis for the state of Virginia or any other to say that an interracial couple could not get married. Well, it certainly wasn't this core procreative purpose that I'm mentioning. Because, Your Honor, that purpose was frustrated by those policies. That purpose actually was at war with the overriding ubiquitous core procreative purpose of marriage because it required people who had interracial couples to... Oh, some of, let me, excuse me for interrupting, but you recall a number of the decisions which upheld those laws and the rationale that was used by the courts in some of those cases was that the mixing of the races was going to be destructive, would have serious corrosive effects on society. Your Honor, th those, those uh, uh, racist, racist uh, sentiments and uh, policies had no foundation in the historical purpose of marriage. Uh, and in fact, again, they were at war with it. Racial restrictions on marriage were not part of the common law. They, they as, as we've maintained from the beginning, the opposite sex nature of marriage is itself definitional. Definitional because of the, as the, again, the Supreme Court is often recognized be, be because this relationship is fundamental to the existence and survival of the human race. Uh, it, so we, this def, the, the, the opposite sex nature of marriage uh, has, has always been definitional. The, the common law didn't place res, racial restrictions on, on marriage. Uh, many states uh, did not place racial restrictions on marriage. Uh, only 16 states at the time of loving still had racial restrictions on marriage. They grew out of this very uh, s uh, particular racist, uh, white supremacist uh, 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 theory, Your Honor, that was at war with all the purposes of, all the legitimate purposes of marriage. Uh, they actually made people uh, have illegitimate children, illegitimate natural uh, children. Uh, which, again, was the, the purpose of marriage, as Justice Stevens says, uh, is to license cohabitation and produce legitimate children. That was the purpose of it. Well, this racial restriction was at war with its very definition, its very nature. The second point I want to make is that these restrictions weren't then why, just... Why isn't the limitation on marriage for gay couples and lesbian couples similarly at war with their desires to raise children, raise their own children in the context of a marriage partnership? Um, Your Honor, again, this, this, is the, this is the distinction that the Eighth Circuit uh, recognized and that case after case is recognized. There, there are uh, distinguishing characteristics relevant to the interests that the state uh, is, is pursuing here. Uh, as, as the Eighth Circuit said, uh, Your Honor, only opposite sex couples can procreate naturally and therefore it is only opposite sex couples who uniquely uniquely address this fundamental historic purpose and who present most importantly uniquely um, the threat to the society's interests that marriage is designed to minimize the threat of irresponsible procreation the threat the, 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 the reality that when procreative sexual relationships between men and women are not channeled uh, into marriage and these stable unions with these binding vows, then m much more frequently 
the society has to um, has to itself cope with the adverse social uh, uh, ramifications and consequences of that kind of irresponsible appropriation. But you don't draw any distinction between the state's interest with respect to a marriage and children of that marriage where the parents have been able to conceive on their own and the situation where an opposite, opposite sex couple have had to require some form of uh, intervention, medical intervention or otherwise, in order to produce children. An increasingly common situation. And the rights and responsibilities of the parents are exactly the same for the children of a latter couple. And the state's interest is exactly the same, is it not? Your Honor, <clears throat> not, they're not quite the same, no. Then what's the difference? You mean where the, the, you had to have an egg donor or a sperm donor or some uh, procedure of that kind in order to produce a child? The state's interest is different in that child and in that marriage? Your Honor, um, the first point I want to make is to, re is to refer back to our earlier uh, colloquy and discussion with respect to the interests that uh, are served by uh, permitting uh, all opposite sex couples to marry uh, without attempting to uh, some kind of intrusive inquiries and what have you into questions of fertility, questions of, of, uh, of uh, you know, desire to have children and what have you. I, I didn't at that time also mention that uh, uh, this, the society's interests are, are also uh, furthered whenever opposite sex couples are married in order to engage in the sexual relationships uh, because that strengthens the social norms that really the, the, the legal institution of marriage relies upon most heavily in order, to, in, in order for this channeling function to be performed. It, is, it, it would be, uh, it, whenever uh, couples, opposite sex couples are in uh, cohabiting relationships, as they, on, you know, as it, as it certainly happens uh, now that they are more often uh, than, than in, in previous times in history, that in and of itself weakens those social norms that seek to encourage uh, 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 and, to, and to channel those types of uh, procreative uh, relationships in, in, into marriage. But to come back specifically to your, to your point, you know, the, the, I really think the state's main concern, uh, or certainly among the state's main concern in regulating marriage, in seeking to channel uh, naturally procreative sexual conduct into stable and enduring unions, is to minimize um, what I would call irresponsible procreation. It's not a good term, but uh, I, I can't think of a more uh, serviceable one. And that is uh, pr procreation that is, uh, um, that, that, that isn't uh, uh, bound by the kinds of obligations and social norms that the marital relationship is, and that and that and that often leads to uh, uh, children being raised by one parent or the other, or sometimes neither parent. That is a phenomenon that is that is uniquely centered on naturally procreative uh, uh, sexual relationships between men and women. It is, it is not a phenomenon that the state has to uh, be concerned about with respect to same-sex couples. For a same-sex couple to procreate, 
it by definition has to be responsible. It can't be by accident. That's, that's the key point, and that's, that's a point that the Eighth Circuit itself stressed in the Bruning case that I, I quoted from earlier. But by, by definition, um, uh, same-sex couples do not naturally procreate, and, and when they procreate and, through and my, and my point was that there are a number of heterosexual couples who do not naturally procreate who require the intervention of some third party or some medical assistance of some kind. Yes, Your Honor, and it is not those opposite sex couples either that the state is concerned about in terms of, um, in terms of the threats to society and the, and the natural concerns that society has from irresponsible procreation. What, what's the threat to society of people choosing to have medical assistance in order to conceive children. No, there isn't one there, Your Honor. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is the, uh, again, it's, it's, it's irresponsible procreation, the, the, the uh, pr procreation that comes about casually and often, again, as the Eighth Circuit put it, often by accident, unintentionally, unintentionally. Uh, the opposite sex couple, where one of the partners is infertile, for example, or the same-sex couple can't unintentionally procreate. Uh, but for, for the reasons that we discussed earlier with respect to the opposite sex but infertile couple, uh, allowing them to marry isn't something that uh, is inconsistent with the purposes of, of the, pro the core procreative purposes of marriage. It isn't, and in fact, in certain respects, it advances those purposes, and it would just not be possible or realistic, as case after case has said, for the state to try to, uh, to, to implement its policy on a more narrow or fitted basis. Um, and, and, Your Honor, with respect to, and you ask a question about this in your, uh, in your written questions, even with respect to the opposite sex couple where one of the partners is, is infertile, uh, encouraging that uh, couple to get married, trying to channel that couple into marriage, furthers the, the uh, procreative purposes and policies uh, underlying uh, the traditional definition of marriage in the sense that if that couple gets married, then it, then, then all of the social norms that come with marriage to encourage that couple to stay together, to, and, and, to, and, to, and, to, uh, and to be faithful to one another, operate to society's benefit in the sense that the fertile member of that uh, couple uh, will be less likely to engage in sexual relationships with third parties and, uh, and raise anew a threat of some type of unintentional or what I've been referring to previously as irresponsible procreation. Why don't, those same, why don't those same values, which are values to societies that you've described, apply to lesbian couples and gay couples? Coming together, supporting one another, taking care of one another, looking out for one another, being uh, an economic unit, being a social unit, providing love, comfort, and support for one another. Why don't all of those considerations apply just as much to the plaintiffs here those, those as are... they apply to uh, John and Jane Doe, to use the, uh, the names that uh, Reverend Tam used? Those, those, those uh, purposes, Your Honor, are... Um, uh, uh, we, we, we haven't suggested there's a, a distinction among gay and opposite sex couples with respect to those considerations. There is a distinction, however, with respect to the, the fundamental procreative uh, purpose, responsible procreative purpose of, of marriage, and that is that the, the, the gay couple, uh, un, unlike the... Uh, 
opposite sex couple where one of the partners may be infertile, um, it doesn't represent uh, neither neither partner in the in, with respect to the same sex couple is uh, uh, again uh, assuming uh, homosexual uh, 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 sexual orientation it, what represents a concern about irresponsible procreation with a third party. But, Your Honor, the, the considerations that you have identified are considerations that the state and its voters have taken account of and they, and they have respected and, and they have credited and they have honored uh, by creating the parallel institution of domestic partnership. And, what does the, the evidence show that the procreative function of marriage was a rationale of the voters in enacting Proposition 8. What's the evidence on that? The evidence in this record. Your Honor, the f the f the f there is substantial evidence in this record. First, Your Honor, is the ballot arguments themselves in the official voter information guide. Uh, the yes on eight uh, position favoring uh, Proposition 8 specifically said, Proposition 8 protects marriage as an essential institution of society. While death, divorce, or other circumstances may prevent the ideal, the best situation for a child is to be raised by a mother and father, a married mother and father. So, Your Honor, the, 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 the central thrust of, of the responsible procreation purpose of, of marriage was, was put forward in the voter information guide itself. But the campaign also, the Yes on 8, the protectmarriage.com, Yes on 8 campaign, uh, spoke to this uh, very substantially. It is not accurate to say that there was no uh, discussion of this, uh, of this concern or this interest in connection with the campaign, uh, uh, in connection with the formal Yes on 8 or ProtectMarriage.com campaign, uh, because there were uh, uh, advocacy pieces after advocacy piece that spoke specifically to this issue. One was a video ad which, uh, which said, is this in the record? Yes, Your Honor. What is it? What exhibit? PX 97. Uh, marriage involves a complex web of social, legal, and spiritual commitments that bind men and women for one overriding social, societal purpose, to create a loving environment for the raising up of children. In, in a, a range of written uh, uh, advocacy uh, 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 pieces, Your Honor, printed materials. The protectmarriage.com said things like this, and th this is actually from PX 27 uh, that, I'm, that I'm going to be reading from. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm starting to lose my voice. <clears throat> Not a bad idea. <laughs> The marriage of a man and a woman has been at the heart of society since the beginning of time. It promotes the ideal opportunity for children to be raised by a mother and father in a family held together by the legal, communal, and spiritual bonds of marriage. And while divorce and death too frequently disrupt the ideal, as a society we should put the best interests of children first, and that is traditional marriage. You know, there were a number of, of uh, and there are before you, a number of those of, of those things from the protectmarriage.com uh, campaign itself. But beyond that, be, quite beyond that, this was a frequent theme within the religious community that was, as you know, quite active in the uh, protect, in, 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 the, uh, in, in the debate, in the political process over Proposition 8. And, and the the, the campaign wasn't just, by any stretch, what protectmarriage.com had to say to the people. 
the, the, the debate was a cacophony of ideas and of arguments and of debates ranging from the fairly ubiquitous television ads throughout that uh, or at least t towards the uh, towards the November 4th itself that appeared on television to conversations at the office water cooler your honor people got their uh, debated this issue uh, in in every venue and every forum in in civic centers it, it was a cacophony of issues and one doesn't certainly doesn't have to uh, pinpoint a, you know a particular argument from a particular source to uh, to conclude that that uh, any, uh, virtually any argument that would have supported one side or the other was being advanced by these very passionate uh, 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 debates. Uh, Your Honor, the, the other point I want to make uh, about this, and it goes to the issue of the, uh, it goes to the issue of the standard review that uh, the, the court will be applying in this case is 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 this we we submit uh, of course as you know that the, the rational basis test applies we we there there has not been a case in the in the so-called marriage equality uh, cases that has applied the federal constitution uh, that has applied any other uh, standard of review. And in fact, beyond that, Your Honor, there has not been a case in the federal judiciary or, uh, as far as we can tell, the state judiciary applying, looking at a sexual orientation classification that has applied anything other than rational basis review. Uh, with with four exceptions, those are there are four district court cases that have applied some form of heightened scrutiny. The Ninth Circuit, we submit to you, has binding controlling authority on this question from the High Tech Gaze case. Uh, ten other circuit courts of appeals, six of those cases uh, with six. Uh, uh, decisions coming after Lawrence have held to the same effect. No court of appeals case has ever applied anything other than rational basis review to a sexual orientation classification. And out of 40 or 40 some odd district court cases, only four have done so, and all four have been reversed. Supporting the plaintiffs on the question of standard of review is nothing. And there is a judicial tsunami that they're asking you to sail into on this question. So we believe that rational basis applies and that, and that if, if we are right and rational basis applies, the state or we, as we attempt to step into the shoes of the state, don't have to submit evidence to the court in support of the claims of purpose and, other, and justification. To the contrary, the plaintiffs have to neg negate every conceivable rational basis, every conceivable rational basis that might explain the, the, uh, the, the policy at issue, the classification issue. And, Your Honor, what that means is they have to negative every conceivable state of facts that could provide a rational basis for the classification. This, this is stated in case after rational basis case, Your Honor, from Garrett and Heller and FCC against Beach, as the court knows from, from, its, uh, from its own questions. And if the state of facts that would support if it was if any conceivable state of facts that would support the classification is even arguable or debated, debatable, as you asked uh, Mr. Olson, then the state's policy must be upheld. It must be a non-debatable uh, proposition. So if I'm looking you at conclude, and the, the, here's, here's perhaps the, I guess, kind of the 
most important point for, for this purpose. Even if you conclude that in fact, by a preponderance of the evidence, they are right on any of their claims, that doesn't matter. You still must rule for the state unless you also conclude that the legislative facts on which the classification is apparently based could not reasonably be conceived to be true. Vance against Bradley. It's, it's, it's not that who's right or who's wrong. It's that no rational person could conceive that the legislative fact relevant to the issue could possibly be true. The standard of review in Romer was rational basis? And Romer, uh, Your Honor, uh, applying that standard, concluded there was not any explanation for the sweeping, uh, uh, disabling, uh, punitive statute uh, discriminating against gays and lesbians in that, in that case, not any uh, uh, explanation that could provide any rational uh, basis for the, for the uh, rule there. And so the only uh, uh, conclusion that could, could be arrived at was that it flowed from animus. It flowed from animus. That was the only thing that could explain this, this, this sweeping, disabling statute that effectively, in the court's words, made gays and lesbians strangers to the law, made them strangers to the law, placed them effectively outside of the law's protections, effectively uh, permanently, or at least until the, um, the electorate uh, uh, amended the Constitution. That well, was an Mr. Olson, can, Mr. Olson contends that Proposition 8 makes gays and lesbians strangers to the institution of marriage in California. <clears throat> well, let me direct you to um, the Minnesota versus Cloverleaf uh, case. And just one sentence <clears throat> by uh, Justice Brennan on this rational basis review standard that uh, we've been discussing. Where there was evidence before the legislature reasonably supporting the classification, litigants may not procure invalidation of the legislation merely by tendering evidence in court that the legislature was mistaken. So, where was the, the evidence here, as I understand your argument, was this evidence with respect to the natural procreative capability of heterosexual couples or opposite sex couples as opposed to the non-natural procreative ability of same-sex couples. That is the evidence that was before the voters here that you are relying upon as providing the rational basis. Am I correct? I've, forgive me, Your Honor, I'm not sure I, I follow what well, particular perhaps, evidence uh, you're, I'm, you're... I'm sure it was not stated very well. But the point that Justice Brennan, I think, was making is that in that Minnesota case, there was evidence before the legislature. It was identified. It wasn't simply some rationale pulled out of the thin air. There was evidence before the legislature to warrant the classification that was made in that case. This was a classification, if I remember correctly, between paperboard milk cartons and plastic milk cartons. Well, the evidence supporting the classification here that you're contending exists is this natural procreative ability of opposite sex couples which distinguishes them from same-sex couples. That's the evidence. Am I correct? That's certainly a, a, a premise. Sorry? Yes, yes, Your Honor. That's it is it. a premise of the uh, responsible procreation rationale. 
Let me ask you, while we have a pause in our discussion, unless you want to move on to something else that follows immediately, uh, about one of the answers that uh, you provided in the response to the written questions. And that was actually the last question. The question was, if the court finds Proposition 8 to be unconstitutional, what remedy would yield the constitutional expression of the people of California's will? Your response. I'm sorry, which it was the last question, number 15. The, exactly. The, the common questions to both the plaintiffs and to the proponents. And I'm reading from pages 45 to 46 of your oh, yeah. response. Okay. And your response was, if, as plaintiffs maintain, Proposition 8 cannot be reconciled with its own non-retrospective application as interpreted by the California Supreme Court, or with any other feature of California law, the remedy that would yield to the constitutional expression of the people of California's will is sustaining Proposition 8 by giving it retrospective effect or invalidating the conflicting feature of California law. Do I understand that what you are saying here is that not only am I required to rule against the plaintiffs, but to invalidate the 18,000 marriages, same-sex marriages that occurred between June and November of 2008? No, Your Honor. That is not our position at all. Uh, Mr. But what, that's what, what these words say. Well, no. Do they not? No. Uh, on, only if there's some irreconcilable conflict between those two things, as Mr. Olson maintains. But we, we, we uh, dispute that there's an irreconcilable conflict. Uh, th this, this goes to, or at least what, we've, what we perceive the court's question to be going to, is, uh, is the plaintiff's argument with respect to the so-called crazy quilt that has been created by uh, Proposition 8 and the interpretation of Proposition 8 in particular uh, in the marriage cases that interpreted Proposition 8 to be prospective only and not to invalidate the 18,000 or so same-sex marriages that took place during that uh, interim period after the decision and before Proposition 8 was, was passed. Uh, our, our position, we, we disagree with Mr. Olson. We don't believe that that has created a, a conflict that requires Proposition 8 to be invalidated. That's what he's arguing, that, it, that it, it, it is irrational, he thinks, to have uh, valid same-sex marriages in the face of uh, Proposition 8's uh, prohibition on same-sex marriages going forward, at least under the marriage cases, interpretation of its prospective only effect. Our, our answer is the, court of, uh, the California Supreme Court uh, simply uh, uh, engaged in an analysis that is quite routine and standard when um, uh, statutes or constitutional amendments are enacted that would affect rights, at least on their face, would appear to affect rights that, uh, and, and interests that have been created under the pre-existing state of the law. This pre-existing state of the law being the uh, not quite five month period when same-sex marriage was, was legal and same-sex marriages were entered into. The, court, the California Supreme Court simply said these reliance interests that have been created as a result of, this, of that court's previous decision I'm here, I'm, I'm referring to the Strauss case where Proposition 8 was at issue and it was interpreted as prospective only, that, that those reliance interests uh, were, were the, uh, the court thought powerful and legitimate and that uh, it uh, was effectively loath to interpret Proposition 8 as upsetting those interests. So Proposition 8 would be given only prospective effect. 
it is not at all uncommon when courts are faced with that kind of situation, and not, un not all that uncommon really when legislatures are, and they decide to cut back on something, uh, to grandfather the individuals who, uh, as, as it is uh, commonly called, to grandfather those interests and protect them from the application, which would, in that circumstance, be uh, especially harsh in consideration of the reliance interests that have been created uh, under the previous, previous regime. We don't think that's irrational. We don't think those two realities create some irrational and unconstitutional crazy quilt, and neither did uh, the California Supreme Court. But all we're saying in our answer is this. If that were to be the case, if what were to be the case? If it were to be the case that Mr. Olson is right and, and the prospective effect and, those, and, and the, and the 18,000 marriages that uh, took place before the passage of Proposition 8 and, and Proposition 8's own prospective effect can't be reconciled and one or the other has to fall, our, our submission is the overriding constitutional judgment of the people is not what should fall here. That is, that is the, the, the Proposition 8 should not be invalidated because of some notion that there's an irreconcilable conflict between it as a prospective statute and the existence of reliance interests that compelled the California Supreme Court not to apply Proposition 8 retrospectively. Obviously, it was before the court to apply, and, and it could have, and, and there were certainly you know, legitimate arguments, that Proposition 8 had a retrospective effect as well. Just as, Your Honor, the California Supreme Court it held in a previous case that um, marriages that had taken place under what was uh, ultimately determined to be a void act of uh, or ordinance or whatever in San Francisco, that all those marriages were were void. Uh, well, that was that was a uh, decision that the California Supreme Court could have rendered it decided not to. We think these things can lie down comfortably along one another. There's not an irrational irra conflict. So it is not our position. We urge you not to conclude that you, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that one or the other of these, uh, uh, of, 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 of these elements must fall. We don't think that is necessary. One or the other of what elements? Well, well, proposition 8 as a prospective prohibition on same-sex marriage on the one hand and the California Supreme Court's interpretation of it allowing uh, the 18,000 same-sex marriages that had taken place before its enactment to remain valid. We think that grandfathering, effectively, of those marriages is perfectly uh, rational. It's perfectly common, and and uh, and uh, and perfectly constitutional. <clears throat> Your Honor. Um, I, I, I want to uh, effectively con, uh, conclude this uh, this uh, piece of my uh, uh, argument by calling the court's attention to a case from the Eleventh Circuit called Lofton. It was a case uh, in which um, the Eleventh Circuit upheld Florida's statute 
that prohibited gay adoptions. Um, that, that at, at, the, at the heart of that case was this consideration that uh, we've been discussing, that is the, effectively the core procreative uh, element or purpose of, of, uh, of, of, of marriage and the, and the um, uh, idea that, it, it, which was displayed again, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, in the official ballot initiative uh, argument, that it is, and that many, many people believe that it is best for a child to be raised by the child's own mother and father. Uh, what, the, what the court there uh, concluded, and I might add that the expert for the plaintiffs in that case was Dr. Lamb. Uh, and uh, ultimately the court concluded that that in fact the evidence submitted there by Dr. Lamb uh, was not uh, adequate to render irrational the common sense belief uh, that children do best when they're raised by their own mother and father, which, which in one of your questions your Honor, you'll recall quoting from the New York Court of Appeals in Hernandez against Robles, uh, that common sense proposition. And this is, what, this, is, this is what ultimately the 11th Circuit was persuaded by. Taking all of this available information into account, the legislature could rationally conclude that a family environment with married opposite sex parents remains the optimum social structure in which to bear children and that the raising of children by same-sex couples, who by definition cannot be the two sole biological parents of a child and cannot provide children with a parental authority figure of each gender, presents an alternative structure for child rearing that has not yet proved itself beyond reasonable scientific dispute to be as optimal as the biologically based marriage norm. And, and, and your, your Honor, this, again, brings forward the, the uh, point that the standard here um, is whether or not the evidence um, uh, produced by the plaintiffs is, is more than just opinion evidence but it actually rises to the level of non-debatable scientific facts. And ultimately the 11th Circuit concluded that that was not, in that, in that case anyway, that simply couldn't be said with respect to the common sense belief that, that uh, many, many, many people hold and many researchers hold that um, the, the optimal uh, child rearing parental structure is the traditional intact family. Um, Your Honor, I want to move, if I may, to um, an, an area that uh, the, the, the plaintiffs have, uh, have emphasized. Uh, they've gone to great lengths to underscore the, the religious beliefs of many of the people who campaigned in pro, uh, uh, and supported uh, Proposition 8. Well, that's, it's, hardly, um, it, it's hardly remarkable uh, in, a, in our a country that, uh, that religious beliefs are, uh, and religious people are involved in the uh, political process. It's part of our constitutional tradition from the American Revolution to the abolitionist movement to the civil rights, to the civil rights movement. Uh, and there are issues, uh, many of them, that confront the legislatures, that confront the body politic, that are bound up and inextricably, uh, uh, inextricably involve uh, moral values and moral judgments uh, from uh, the death penalty 
gambling, obscenity, prostitution, um, and uh, an issue that was before the Supreme Court uh, not, not that long ago uh, in the Glucksburg case, the issue of assisted suicide. The court there rejected a substantive due process challenge to a state statute that prohibited physician-assisted suicide. And, and, and the court noted that throughout the nation, Americans are engaged in an earnest and profound debate about the morality, legality, and practicality of physician-assisted suicide. And the court held that the Constitution permits this debate to continue, as it should in a democratic society. And you know, the, the, the court was very careful to, to make clear that when a court is presented with a claim of a, uh, that asking the court to define some new fundamental right, that the court must very carefully analyze that claim and must insist that it be rooted, deeply rooted in the country's history and traditions in order not, uh, in order to protect against the judiciary unnecessarily um, uh, taking important issues uh, off uh, the table of the democratic process. This is true also of marriage, we would submit. Again, well, you, you concede that there are times when it is appropriate for the courts to do exactly that. Yes, We've of talked course. about... Uh, the Loving decision, and we've talked about uh, the Brown decision and various others. Yes, what are the criteria that a court should use in making that determination? Your Honor, I think, I think the criteria is what, is, what the, um, is what the Supreme Court itself has articulated, um, that the, the right claimed uh, must be deeply rooted in the history, traditions, and practices of the of And the, in this case, country. marriage is a deeply rooted and fundamental right. No doubt about that, okay? Your Honor, yeah. And that, as Mr. Olson described this morning, is a right which extends essentially to all persons, whether they are uh, capable of producing children, whether they're incarcerated, whether they're uh, behind in their child support payments, um, there, there really is no limitation except, as Mr. Olson pointed out, a gender limitation. Well, Your Honor, and, and, that, and that gender limitation is, is a definitional feature of the right to marry. It's a definitional feature. It, that, that is clear from the court's repeated statement that the reason marriage is fundamental is that it is fundamental to the existence and survival of the human race. It's it is appropriated. Because it is a gender specific right. That That's what right, you're saying. Yes, I am. The right is gender specific. The right itself, the right to marry, is bound up with and proceeds from the fundamental nature uh, and, 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 its, and its fundamental purpose relating to procreation and uh, the existence and survival of, of the human race. So it is itself, by definition, the right of a man to marry a woman and vice versa. That is, that is the right. And, Your Honor, that's... Well, let, that, me, th all right, then let me ask you about something that you said in one of the other responses to the written questions. This is um, number nine, and I believe that was a question posed to um, both parties. On page uh, 21 of your response. Um, It's, um, I beg your pardon, it's number 10. Uh, number 10, and if it helps, the ribbon is document 687, page 25 of 50.
And you say, with respect to sexual orientation, as a socially constructed category, sexual orientation clearly fails the requirement, and the requirement posited is social constructivism suggests that there is nothing real about sexual orientation except society's construction of it. Not surprisingly, social constructionists generally reject the possibility of biological factors in sexual orientation. What, I, what that leads me to ask you is, aren't these distinctions that we're drawing sexual orientation distinctions, gender distinctions. From a legal point of view, are they not all socially constructed? <clears throat> no, Your Honor, I think there would be a fundamental difference, at least if I <clears throat> understand the thrust of this inquiry, between, for example, a gender distinction and a distinction, distinction drawn along the lines of, of sexual orientation. Um, because I, I, we took this and the notion of social construction to go to, the, to, to, go to what we think are the very difficult uh, issues surrounding sexual orientation it's the, and, and its uh, amorphous, uh, if effectively, indefinable, at least consistently, uh, uh, nature. And, and the simple fact that it is not immutable. Uh, our submission, uh, obviously, is that sexual orientation is not an immutable trait that is uh, uh, an accident of um, an accident of birth, which... Uh, an accident of birth? Sex, your gender. Talking here about the. It can be changed before birth, but not after birth. What do you mean? It's an accident of birth. Accident of birth, in the sense that that term is, has been used consistently by the Supreme Court, to uh, identify the kinds of immutable characteristics that um, that that go into the calculus on whether heightened scrutiny should apply. Political powerlessness, immutability, and a history of discrimination, essentially the, 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 the three uh, principal issues. And religious and, discrimination is, of course, prohibited as one of these fundamental rights and subject to strict scrutiny. If the state imposes some limitation or classification based on religion, and religion certainly is not an immutable characteristic, that's that's true, Your Honor. But we would we would submit that this that uh, the heightened and strict scrutiny that is accorded to uh, religious classifications springs not from the Equal Protection Clause, but from the First Amendment. And we think that Davy against Locke um, supports that proposition. We don't we 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 believe that the the areas that the Supreme Court, at least thus far, has identified as, uh, as qualifying for heightened scrutiny have been race, of course, the central concern of the 14th Amendment, which, by the way, uh, I forgot to mention when we were discussing loving, but, um, but that, too, was a key point and, and one that the court repeated and the loving court repeatedly made was that the central concern of the 14th amendment was to eliminate all invidious racial discrimination and and obviously here that that is that is not uh, that is not the case but to come back to the immutability issue um, the ninth circuit in the high-tech gaze case said unequivocally sexual orientation is not an immutable characteristic i think that's that's a quote. Um, and uh, Your Honor, measured against the Supreme Court's decisions, uh, we submit that is plainly right. And again, we, uh, we, we are aware 
we are aware of no case that has held heightened scrutiny on an equal protection clause or anything else applies to a sexual orientation classification. Every case holds to the contrary. Uh, and specifically on the immutability issue, the, the record before you is really quite, uh, quite overwhelming that the, 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 the characteristics of immutability simply do not apply with respect to sexual orientation. Not only is it difficult to define as almost all of the plaintiff's uh, uh, experts testified to, and, and there are at least three definitions, the behavioral-based definition, the attraction-based uh, uh, definition, and the self-identity-based definition, that depending on which one you use, there's a wide variety of the people who are within that class. Uh, beyond that, Your Honor, and not, not, not just its amorphous and difficult uh, definitional uh, situation, is the fact that the uh, plaintiff's witnesses were quite candid and, and uh, unequivocal and uniform that sexual orientation does change. It does change over time. And it, and it apparently changes especially uh, in, in, in women. Uh, uh, there, there, were, there was testimony from uh, Dr. Peplau about the astonishing plasticity of sexual orientation in women and that many women experience a change in their sexual orientation several times over the course of a lifetime, but perhaps the most, uh, perhaps the most uh, uh, I, I would think vivid uh, uh, evidence was a, an APA study which indicated that over a 10-year period for women who uh, identified uh, 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 who, who identified themselves in, as homosexuals, uh, some uh, two-thirds of them had changed their their uh, uh, sexual orientation essentially had experienced themselves a change in their sexual orientation at least once over the course of their lifetimes and a third uh, more than once. So, and, and this does go directly to the Supreme Court's test of immutability. Is it an accident of birth? Here's what uh, Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, has said about this test. The immutable characteristic notion, as it appears in Supreme Court decisions, is tightly cabined. It is a trait determined solely by the accident of birth. And, and here, Your Honor, the traits or the characteristics that have been determined to be uh, immutable and to qualify for heightened scrutiny by the Supreme Court have been things like race, which is obviously determined at birth. It's an at quote an accident of birth, gender, uh, uh, and uh, illegitimacy, and, and, it, and, and as Judge, uh, Judge Ginsburg also said, it doesn't mean it's something that can't be changed, but it is something that is national uh, origin also one of those. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Um, and uh, people, I don't know whether they change their national origin. But on St. Patrick's Day, everybody is Irish. <laughs> <laughs> and I've experienced that to change myself. Well, that's yeah. correct. And uh, people can look to one ancestor and suddenly become that, and then on another occasion pick another ancestor, and maybe even invent an ancestor. So uh, these immutability characteristics, they really are not the important factor, are they, in deciding what the level of scrutiny is? Well, Your Honor, yes, uh, with, with respect. It, it, is a, it is a critical, uh, it is a critical element, but it isn't, uh, it isn't more or different, uh, differently qu critical than, say, political power. And, Your Honor, under the Supreme Court's test for political powerlessness, uh, we would submit to you again that the evidence is overwhelming that gays and lesbians uh, are not politically powerless, uh, notwithstanding 
uh, Dr. Segura's uh, testimony, which we believe advanced to, to the court a test for judging political powerlessness that is that it just simply has no uh, basis in the legal principles that this court is bound to apply. The, the legal test from the Supreme Court was stated uh, clearly in the Cleburne case as does the group, they're the mentally disabled, does the group uh, have the ability to attract the attention of the lawmakers, of the decision makers, attract the attention. In high-tech gaze in the Ninth Circuit, uh, the court said that gays and lesbians, 20 years ago, gays and lesbians are not politically powerless because they, they clearly have the ability to attract the attention of the lawmakers. And that was, that was 20 years ago, Your Honor. And since that time, uh, the, as I think all of the plaintiff's witnesses acknowledged, there's been just an extraordinary uh, 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 evolution. I, I think uh, Dr. Chauncey used the word sea change in the attitudes and the, and, and the uh, acceptance of, of gays and lesbians and in the, their political power, especially as reflected in the extraordinary difference in the, in the legal landscape between today and 20 years ago with respect to most, protections. Isn't that the most important factor? That is this historical context in that women are hardly politically powerless. They are a majority of the population, probably a majority of the voters. Uh, they have considerable political power, and yet a law which classifies women in some fashion differently from men is subject to strict scrutiny. Uh, African Americans are hardly politically powerless, and they've had enormous uh, political gains in the last 50 years or so, uh, and yet laws that single them out from others would be subject to strict scrutiny. Isn't it that it's the historical context that determines whether or not strict scrutiny is appropriate for a particular classification more than the political power factor or the immutability factor or these other factors? Isn't that really what decides the issue? Your Honor, I think, it's, I think it is a it is an interesting, different, and perhaps in some ways difficult question whether or not, for example, women whose, whose, um, whose political power and, and whose positions of political and positions holding and exercising political power has changed so dramatically uh, since Reed against Reed in 1971 and Frontiero in 1973 when the court first concluded that gender is uh, a quasi-suspect classification requiring an intermediate level of, of, of scrutiny. Uh, at that time, when the court had before it this question and, we and whether or not political powerlessness uh, uh, of, of, of the group uh, uh, suggested that they needed extraordinary protection from the majoritarian political process that only the courts could provide. At that time, Your Honor, women were still f effectively 50% of the population, but they held like 2%, 2% of the elected office, offices in this country, as the Frontiero uh, Court said. Uh, I, I don't, it was a minuscule percentage, I'm not sure it was two. Okay. A legislative uh, facts, I assume. Yes, yes, Your Honor, absolutely. That is not the case, uh, certainly not in California, with respect to uh, uh, gays and lesbians. Um, so I do believe that the time that... that but, the, but isn't Proposition 8 and these other propositions in other states that limit marriage to opposite sex couples the DOMA statute that has been mentioned, the exclusion of gays and lesbians from military service for a long period of time, aren't all of those simply indicia of a long history of discrimination? 
Your Honor, we would, we would uh, I want to be clear on this. We have never disputed and we have offered to stipulate that gays and lesbians have been the victims of a long and shameful history of discrimination. We, we, we uh, have been bound to note that thankfully uh, the situation today in, in, in 2010 is not what it was uh, even yesterday, let alone in 1990 when high tech gaze was, was decided. Thankfully, uh, but 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 it isn't adequate. Uh, the the fact of a history of discrimination uh, is not by itself uh, sufficient to warrant heightened judicial scrutiny. The court has always insisted as well on immutability of the of the characteristic and political powerlessness at the time that the issue comes forward to the court. Um, the, the question of polit political powerlessness, yes, it would have been very different 20, it, it was very different 20 years ago in high tech gays, very different. But the Ninth Circuit nonetheless believed that gays and lesbians could attract the attention of the lawmakers even then. It's, if, if that was true, it follows undebatably that it must be true today. And, and, the, and the court in, in the Cleburne case held that even though the mentally retarded had suffered a history of discrimination in many respects, and even though mental disability is immutable, the mentally disabled nonetheless couldn't qualify for heightened scrutiny and, and only rational basis review uh, applied on classifications drawn there because the mentally disabled had political power. They could attract the attention of lawmakers. And obviously they had to rely to attract the attention of lawmakers on allies, not on their own resources, their own, uh, the, 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 the own, uh, their, their own political muscle and their own numbers, uh, but had to rely upon uh, uh, upon others who allied with their interests uh, to create that political power. And, and Your Honor, if they weren't politically powerless, then, and, and that case was decided, I think, in 1987 or so, just a couple of, through, two or three years before high tech gaze was decided. And so, uh, Your Honor, if, if, if they didn't uh, qualify, it was, it was not a close call, I would submit to you, in the Ninth Circuit in high-tech gaze, and it is certainly not a close call today. Um, so our, our submission, Your Honor, is, is that with respect to heightened scrutiny under the Equal Protection Clause, uh, the courts that have uniformly decided this case uh, against the application of heightened scrutiny have been correct. Um, I ask you about something, but go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm uh, trying mentally here to assess where we've been and what I have in front of me, but if you, uh, I'm here to, to try to respond as best I can to your questions, John. Fair enough. Um, Mr. Blankenhorn, why should Mr. Blankenhorn's testimony be admitted? Does he meet the Daubert standards? Your Honor, I submit to you that he does. Um, um, I'm, I, I, by the way, I didn't understand your earlier ruling to be your, your ruling uh, accepting him as an expert to have been provisional. Uh, but uh, the court has, uh, I think in its questions, uh, clarified that. Um, 
but uh, I, I, I really don't have anything to add to the, uh, to the submission we made when the motion in limine was before you, or, 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 or the, or the uh, voir dire uh, took place, and the motion in limine. Uh, I, I would uh, say, Your Honor, that under this Ninth Circuit standard for the qualification of an expert, that Mr. Blankenhorn is amply uh, qualified. I believe amply qualified, I submit to you. Um, he, he, his his, his uh, professional life for 20 years has been devoted to the study of one subject, the subject of marriage, the subject of the potential uh, uh, and, 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 and parenting structures, and the potential for harm to marriage uh, from a variety of, of social uh, uh, phenomenon, including uh, uh, now same-sex marriage. He's written two books on this subject matter, uh, as, which have been the product of deep study and wide study. Those books have been received uh, with, with respect by recognized experts, including uh, Dr. Lamb. They peer-reviewed? The book? Yes. No, Your Honor, no. In fact, am I correct that the only peer review uh, writing of Mr. Blankenhorn was not on the subject of this litigation? I can't, Your Honor, as I stand here right now, I can't answer that. All right, fair enough. <laughs> I can't. Um, but, but, Your Honor, I think the Ninth Circuit's uh, uh, standards for qualifying an expert are particularly liberal. And, um, and I don't think they require, uh, they certainly don't insist upon uh, uh, that uh, an expert's uh, uh, publications have been peer reviewed. That's an element, but it's not, uh, it's not a mandatory one. Um, so, Your Honor, I, 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 again, I, I didn't really come ex uh, right. here prepared to, uh, to particularly re-argue that, but I do believe that the transcript provides uh, all, all that I had to say uh, with respect to that issue. All right. Well, if in the cool light of the morning you want to submit anything further on that, I'll be happy to. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that, uh, Your Honor. I, give I, you the opportunity. <laughs> well, would the court entertain, uh, well, we're, we're a break? Maybe, f maybe five minutes? Sure, of course. Yeah. Why don't we take a little more than that and uh, resume at 10 minutes after the hour, and we'll finish Mr. Cooper for, uh, well, maybe 20 minutes, and then... At most, Your Honor. At right? most, if I and can then, uh, own in. And then whoever is going to rebut uh, for the plaintiffs. Okay. Mr. Olson.